Beloved, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's stand in his presence and praise him for his victory over sin and death and hell. 360, Christ the Lord is risen today. We'll sing the first four stanzas. 360, one through four, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let's call upon the name of the Lord in a moment of silent prayer and ask for his help in our worship. We'll conclude by singing, hear our prayer, O Lord. Let's take a moment then to pray.
beloved people of God, and whose name is your help? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lift up your hearts to our God in heaven and receive his greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together 367. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. 367. Christ arose. He was delivered over to death for our sins, says the Bible, and raised for our justification. And as we read his holy law this morning, remember that in Christ's death and resurrection, the payment went through, was, was approved. You have forgiveness, but you also have power resurrection power to fight your sin and to walk in the way of the Lord. So let's hear his law with those ears of God's grace. God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Jesus Christ proved himself to be the Son of God by his resurrection, says the Bible. The name of God is in him. Let's honor and worship Christ. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. So that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Brothers and sisters, in our culture we're giving away the Lord's day. Our Sabbath is now the first day of the week when Jesus rose. We're giving it away. We don't value it anymore. But today as we remember Easter, the day the Lord rose... The first day of the week, let us remember that's a day for coming together, being strengthened in our faith and growing in godliness. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or his field or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Above all, congregation, the Lord Jesus rescued us from hatred. By nature, we hate God and our neighbor brought us into love, and that's the summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's the first and greatest commandment, and the second like it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Thank God for his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In him we have forgiveness of sins. In him we have the power of new life. Let's come to him, confessing our sins and praying for that power to fill our lives. In Christ alone, my strength, my hope is found. 265, and let's sing the four stanzas together.
No fear. Because of Christ, we can come to the throne of God. It's a throne of grace. Let's come to him by faith this morning. We do want to remember our sister Nicole Prang. She needs to have her foot surgery redone, and that's scheduled for this Wednesday, Lord willing, this Wednesday. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for raising your son from the grave on the third day. What power, what grace. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for raising yourself from the grave by your own power, according to the Father's will. And we praise you, Holy Spirit, for invading the body of the Son and reinvigorating, giving life back, putting breath back in the body and causing you to stand and escape that tomb into newness of immortal life. Thank you, Jesus, that you did that for us so that when we face the wall of sin, judgment, and death, there's a doorway. There's a doorway into light and life and peace joy and hope that nobody can ever take away from us. Jesus, you are that door. On Easter morning so long ago, Jesus, you finished creating the gospel by your death and resurrection. And we thank you now that that gospel is going out to the ends of the earth. And it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that that good news has reached our hearts and our homes. And we thank you for the way that that power of Christ is at work through the word, through the gospel. And we ask that you will continue that work to the ends of the earth that the gospel may go forward and we may be its faithful messengers. Again, we pray, Lord of harvest, send forth reapers. Raise up reapers even from our own midst to go out into the harvest field to preach the gospel of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for hope in every situation that we face. Life is no longer a dead end. There's a doorway of hope for us, whatever our issue. And so we can lay all our needs before you in that confidence that trouble does not have the last word. Death and the grave do not have the last word. Hell does not have the last word. Life does. Righteousness and life. Heaven, the new creation. Thank you that our brother Ernest is back home. Continue to give him healing and strength. Watch over our sister Nellie Vandermaiden as she heals from a broken shoulder. We pray that you will give her relief from the pain. We pray that you will give her healing and a full recovery. Watch over her. We pray for our shut-ins who have a hard time getting around and maybe even fully dependent on the care of others. Draw near to them in your gracious power. Remind them of your promises. Fill them with hope. And Lord, even if their minds are too feeble to remember, will you remember them and give them peace and comfort? We pray for our brother Hans and our sister Anna who continue to receive chemotherapy. Renew their strength. Give Anna a special measure of your grace as she deals also with heart troubles at the same time and with infection. Lord, we pray that you will be her strength and joy continually and allow her to enjoy each day with her family in the service of the Lord. Watch over Jeff and the children as well. Be their strength. Lord, be near to all the congregation in every need, whatever that may be, whether we're in a life and death war against temptation or maybe wrestling with doubts or dealing with depression and darkness of, of mind or maybe deep heartaches in our families, maybe dealing with constant headaches or rheumatism or respiratory issues, maybe carrying burdens 
too heavy for us to bear. Come and visit us, Lord Jesus, in your resurrection power to open a way through the hardship and lead us into purity, joy, making a new start. Give us hope and strength to serve you with gladness every day in spite of the hardships we face. May we show forth the power of your resurrection. We pray for our brothers and sisters in India and many other places enduring persecution. Remind them this Easter Sunday that the cause of Christ is not lived in vain. Even when we have to suffer for your name, draw near to the Horos and the Samuels and help them in their tasks. Draw near to each one of our brothers and sisters living in persecution. Be near to our brothers and sisters in Haiti as they face the horrors of anarchy. Draw near to Karen Bolcha and those at Coram Deo and give them a special protection. Bless the church of the Lord Jesus there at this time. And in your mercy, Lord, raise up a good, stable government in that country and establish long-term stability and prosperity so that the country, Lord, may flourish after so many years of poverty and, and brokenness. Comfort our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and give them grace to endure this destructive and demoralizing war they face. Bring about an end to the war and give world leaders wisdom for good and selfless leadership in this matter. We pray for the spread of the gospel in the Middle East, Lord, in Israel's war against terrorism. We pray for a good resolution which puts an end to the constant warfare and the terrorist organizations would no longer be a threat there. Above all, Lord, we remember our brothers and sisters in Israel and among the Palestinians and pray that you will use this to advance the gospel, that churches and missionaries may prosper in the spread of the gospel. Lord, continue to bless all of our loved ones and all their needs. We pray for Mayamba and Yvonne, for Victoria and Esther, and ask that soon you would allow them to uh, immigrate from Kenya to, to Canada. And we ask, Father, for your blessing upon us as we wait for them and prepare for their arrival and as for, upon them as they wait to come. Lord, as our sister Nicole antici anticipates surgery this Wednesday. We ask that you will bless her and keep her. We pray that this time the surgery will go well and be successful. We commend her to your good care and ask also for healing mercies. On this Lord's Day, we bless you. We praise you and you worship you. We worship you. Receive the praise we bring you in Jesus' name, the giving of our offerings, the lifting up of our songs, the opening of of the scriptures, we pray that you will speak to us through your holy word and grant us joy in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's honor the Lord with our offerings today. Our offerings are first for our church and secondly for the diaconate. May the Lord bless these gifts.
Let's stand to sing 118B. We'll sing stanzas one, three through five, and then eight. One, three, four, five, and eight of the glorious gates of righteousness throw open unto me, 118B. turn to Matthew 27 and 28 this morning, page 992 in your pew Bibles. We read of the mockery and death of Christ on Good Friday. And now let's carry on with the rest of the story, his burial and resurrection. Page 992, Matthew 27, we'll begin to read at verse 57. When it was evening, There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, 
We remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word, his good word. May he bless us by it and build our faith and godliness. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, today we want to go back to the first Easter, about 2,000 years ago, the day Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Now some object to the word Easter. They say it comes from the name of a pagan goddess, Ishtar. Most likely it comes from an old Latin word for dawn, like the early morning dawn, and later translated into the German word Ostern which became Easter. But whatever the origin of the word, it's the event that matters. And if the word Easter means dawn, that's exactly what this event is about. At dawn on Easter morning, the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the grave, and on that day a whole new world dawned. He opened up a whole new creation. The first one to break through death into everlasting life. Yes, others were raised from the grave, but not into glorified bodies for immortality. The first one to break through the curse, the wages of sin, which is death. So a whole new world opens up for those who belong to Jesus. There's life on the other side of sin, judgment, and death. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ didn't rise, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. But Christ has risen indeed. Jesus opened a door through sin and death into a world of forgiveness and life. And now there's hope for everyone who believes in Jesus. So let's see this morning the new day, new life, and the new world that God proclaims to us in Matthew 28 through Christ who's risen from the dead. A new day, new life, and a new world. Let's look first at Sunday's empty tomb, the first Easter morning, filled with new and strange things. 
unusual. And, and Matthew, who has the most compressed account of Jesus' resurrection, squeezing together a whole number of events that are filled out in more detail in the other Gospels, he lists seven new and unusual things that signal that God was doing something new and earth-shaking that morning. The first of the seven things, dawn. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, a new day is beginning, a new week is beginning. And in Jewish history, this is the day of first fruits. The Sunday after the Passover was the day of first fruits, where they took some green barley and offered it to the Lord as a guarantee that the rest of the harvest is coming. What a day for Jesus to rise. The first day of the week from the Old Testament is the day of first fruits, which now becomes the day of resurrection. And he's the first fruits of those who die in the Lord Jesus Christ. That your death when you die, believer, is not death. It's a doorway to everlasting life. So Jesus burst a hole through death and opened a door to life for us on that morning. The first Adam brought death through his disobedience. The last Adam brought life through his obedience. And ever since then, the church has been meeting on the first day of the week as our day of worship. Jesus himself setting that pattern when he met with his disciples on the first day of the week and again the next Sunday, and then next Sunday, Thomas was with them. The second new or unusual thing, an angel. It's the second thing we meet on that first Easter. There were more than one angel that morning. It was more than one angel, but Matthew focuses on the first angel that came. Now, in the Bible, when angels come, God is announcing something new, something great. Something special. And that's what this angel is going to do. A messenger from God to announce that Jesus has risen from the dead. So he's descended from heaven, this angel, to meet the two Marys. Other women come as well. Some at the same time, some at different times. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. They're going to the tomb to pay their last respects. They're not expecting a... Let's go and see if he's risen Nobody's believing that. Third unusual thing, an earthquake. As the angel comes down from heaven to earth, from God, the whole earth around the tomb shakes. That's God's way of saying, take note. Take note. Something incredibly big and earth-shaking has happened to the world this morning. Even seismologists, their studies, the Middle East, the earth around Palestine. Notice earthquakes, evidence of earthquakes around the year 31. Fourth thing, an open tomb. The angel rolled the stone away and sat on it. The women coming to the tomb face really three obstacles. A huge heavy stone that they can't move. The stone is sealed under the authority of the guard, of the government. You break that seal, you're dead. And a guard that the Sanhedrin has placed there with authorization from Pilate. How are you going to break through all that? They probably don't know the guard is there or the seal, but they do know about the stone. Another gospel has them saying, on the way, oh yeah, who's going to roll the stone away? But the angel takes care of all these obstacles for them. And he opens the tomb not to let Jesus out. Jesus is already out. He passed through the walls in his glorified body. But to let the witnesses in to show them. Come, says the angel. See the place where he's lay, where he lay. The fifth thing. Falling guards. The angel's appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, verse 3, verse 4. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They were put, put there to keep out the grave robber, not to keep away angels. They, they didn't sign up for this. Obviously, there's something 
unusual and heavenly happening. Something from the divine realms. And they fall to the ground in fear and paralysis. You know, guards can stop people, right? But they can't stop angels. They can't stop God, most of all, from doing his work. How great thou art. The sixth thing, an empty tomb. But the angel said to the women, verse 5, don't be afraid for I know that you're seeking Jesus who's crucified. He's not here. He's risen, as he said, come see the place where he lay. Now we know from the other gospels, they went inside and looked and didn't see. The great clothes were there, but the body wasn't. What an honor. God is letting these women be the first witnesses of the empty tomb and, and of the risen Lord a, a moment later. You know, if this was made up, it would never be made up this way since women were considered unreliable and their witness was not allowed in a court of law. It really happened this way. An empty tomb. And then the seventh thing, the first commission, the angel then told the two Marys, go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead and behold, he's going before you to Galilee and there you will see him. See, I have told you. They'll be the first evangelists. We'll tell the disciples Jesus has risen and that Jesus will meet the disciples in Galilee. He'll first meet them in Jerusalem, we know from the other gospels, but he's going to keep an appointment that he made with them. If you look back a couple of chapters to Matthew 26, verse 52, he's made an appointment with them, and that's where he's going to give the Great Commission. Just before he's arrested, he made an appointment. After I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. They can't hear any of that because of their blindness in their heart or their mind. They, they can't see that and they can't process that, but he said it. He's going to keep that appointment because he's risen from the dead. Now, what a lot of things to have happened to you before breakfast, brothers and sisters. A day of wonders. And these testimonies are all important for us to know because they teach us the Lord is risen as he said. And God presents all these witnesses of Christ's resurrection because we're doubters. Now, today people read the Bible and they say, oh, I have a college education. They didn't back then. I live in a scientific age. I don't believe in resurrections. Those guys back then were pre-scientific supernaturalists who believed those things. No, they didn't. Sure, atheism wasn't popular then, but no one, no one at all, not the guards, not the women, not the disciples, nobody expected a resurrection, even though Jesus had said it several times. And the Lord gives them layer and layer and layer of evidence that something new, something special is happening on Sunday morning. Because their minds were so close to it that even though Jesus mentioned it several times before his trial and death, they had no categories in their mind to process it. And they couldn't even hear what he was saying. Even when you get to the Great Commission many days later, see that in verse 16? Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some of the 11 still doubting. And even when we read in Acts 1, during the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and ascension, where he spends lots of time with his disciples, his apostles, preparing them to go out once the Holy Spirit is poured out. It says... He showed them many convincing proofs that he was alive. It's like every day they got up and said, is this real? Is this really real? And they kept doubting and he kept showing himself. So you know what? If you doubt, if you doubt, you're not the first one. The ones who saw all the evidence as eyewitnesses, they doubted too. It took many direct encounter, encounters to convince them. But you know what? 
God's word is true. He doesn't lie. The Bible is truthful from beginning to end. Why would it lie in the biggest point it makes? That would be to say the whole thing is a hoax, which it cannot be. Just from reading, a surface reading of it. But think also of this. I also find this very convincing. You know, if 200 years later, some people said, Jesus rose, we saw him. Let's start a new religion. Eh. You know, how can you go back 200 years and really find the body, the dead body, to prove it? This is a hoax. This is not true. This is the third day. That's when this started. If it was a lie, they would have uncovered the body. They would have found it for sure. They never did. They covered it over with a lie they tried. No body. Well, the second thing we see here is Jesus' risen body. See all the evidences that there's a resurrection, but we haven't seen him yet. Well, Jesus is going to take care of that too. Jesus' risen body, verses 8 and 9. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. So they go to tell the disciples what they saw. They're going with a mixture of fear and great joy. So they believe, but they don't. (laughs) Somewhere in there. Their emotions are all over the place. They can't believe it yet, but they almost have to believe it after seeing all these things. And then Jesus himself gives them the ultimate proof by meeting them face to face, saying greetings. And it's a bit of an interesting word in the Greek. New King James has rejoice. Christian Standard Bible or the Holman Christian Standard Bible has good morning. It's like cheers. That's what the word is. Cheers. Happiness. What a greeting. What a way to say hello after you've been through hell and death and back again. It's really a wonderful word. And they fall down before him. They grab his feet and they worship him. Brothers and sisters, let that be your response to Easter. Worship Christ. I know we can't grab his feet physically. He's in heaven. But we can bow before him and worship because he's worthy. And that's what you read in the book of Revelation. All creation worshiping God the Father and the Lamb. And at the center of the worship is the church represented by the elders. Listen to Revelation 5. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The elders representing the whole church. And he's calling you, brothers and sisters, to worship his son today. Because he's risen from the dead and proved he is Lord of all. Matthew is speaking of him as the king, the true son of David. He's the only king who can bring you over from death to life. Really, The resurrection is God's answer to the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember, you're always hitting that wall. Death. Death means everything you do comes to nothing in the end. It makes everything vain and meaningless. Unless somebody breaks through. Jesus is the one who broken through, opened a door. The king who takes us through to the other side. No other king has ever done that. 
taken away your sin and opened a door to heaven for you. Maybe you've never worshipped him in spirit and truth. Maybe you've just shown up, done your thing to look good, or because it's your custom, focused on secondary things that are not of Christ, but have never fallen down before Christ and worshipped him. Let this day be a new day in your life of worship. But there's another story floating around out there. If you, you can believe it if you want. We read of that other story in Matthew 28. The story of Jesus' enemies who felt threatened by Jesus and crucified him. Ha, ah, now we're rid of him, but except we're not because Easter comes to do their doorstep as well. Because some of the guards who saw all this, they went running to the city and they told the chief priests and all that had taken place. The women are running one way to tell the disciples to go to Galilee, where they'll see Jesus. The guards are running another way to the chief priest to say something has gone terribly wrong. And do the chief priests say, well, go and tell everybody you meet you've seen Jesus. He's risen. No. They send them with the opposite message, these false shepherds in Israel. Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. We'll pay you big bucks to do that because we know there's some threat involved. And if Pilate says, what are you doing sleeping on the job? You should die. We'll, we'll pay him off too. Don't worry. We'll take care of him. You'll be okay. So these women are running to tell the story empowered by truth. The others are going out to tell a lie empowered by Big bucks by money. I wonder which one is true. But the story of the guards, the disciples came and stole his body, it's much more natural. For those who believe resurrections can't happen, God is not able. On the other hand, it's much harder to believe because the disciples wouldn't risk anything for Jesus while he was alive. Why would they risk anything for him now that he's dead? Passing by the guard, breaking the seal, rolling the stone open, which would surely wake them up if they were sleeping. There's like a 0% chance of that happening. They have no evidence to back up, to back up this fake news. We have so much evidence to back up the other story, the true story, the resurrection. But God is placing before us the challenge. You know, you really do have two options. He arose or he didn't. What are you going to, what are you going to pick? He arose or he didn't. You're going to choose the risen Jesus or the dead one. And many reject the Lord Jesus Christ as their king. They refuse to worship him because they embrace the narrative that the resurrection of Christ didn't happen. It's too hard to believe. But it's really much harder to believe that it didn't happen. Reject this king and all you have in front of you is a big heavy wall into which you'll crash and there's no escape, no king to get you through. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a door. New life, hope. And that's what we see, what happened on that Sunday and the days following when those skeptical disciples, they encountered the risen Lord, they were so afraid and despairing, but something occurred after Jesus' death that utterly changed them. Something occurred that pulled them out of the hiding places where they'd fled in hopeless fear. Somebody writes, something moved them to start publicly insisting at the risk of their lives that the carpenter was, wonder of wonders, alive. And when the blows came, blows of persecution, 
Something propelled them to keep preaching all the more boldly, even rejoicing that they'd been counted worthy to suffer dis disgrace for his name. Only a true physical, real resurrection could produce such transformation. They met him, the risen Lord, the Lord of life, and he continues to change the lives of those who believe in him. Why? Because he is risen, he opens a door of new life for you. He's a door to forgiveness, a door to life, a door to powerful change. Because when you believe in him, he comes to live inside you. That's what happens. When you believe in Jesus Christ, the Jesus of Good Friday and Easter, the Holy Spirit plants resurrection power in your life so that you not only receive the forgiveness of sins, but you receive the power to change, to say no to lust and yes to purity. And I know some of you right now are going through severe temptation where you want to pack it all in so that you can go into the deep end of sin. Jesus is saying, come to me and find power of new life. And others are struggling with anger, sinless anger, or sinful anger in their life. Other self-centeredness where they hate to give themselves away. They, they're, they're afraid of the risk. Christ has in his resurrection power. Power for you. New life. And growing life as a believer too. You can keep coming back to the power of Christ crucified. Good Friday power to put your sin to death. And Easter power to put on the new life, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all in him. I want to read a story that Tim Keller tells. A true story. There was a minister in Italy who saw the grave of a man who had died centuries before. This man was an unbeliever. He was completely against Christianity, but he was afraid it might be true. So he asked that when he died, he'd be put in a grave and a huge stone slab be put over the grave so that he wouldn't be raised from the dead. Make it really big and really heavy so he won't be raised from the dead. In case there's a resurrection, I don't want it to come to me. And then he had signs put all over that slab on his tomb saying, I don't want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. True story. Real tomb. But what happened is when he was buried, evidently an acorn had fallen into the tomb. It sprouted, grew. It split open the rock, and it was growing through the top of the tomb. And the minister said, wait, if natural biotic life like a tree can break open the tomb, what about the power of Christ's resurrection to remove the slabs of rock that are weighing down your life? Those sins, bitterness, insecurity, fears, anger, lust, addiction, those things can be split and rolled off your life. That the risen Christ. Jesus' risen body, and we see thirdly, the world's wonderful king. Oh, he's a powerful king for us. He did, died to destroy the old self of sin and rose again to raise up a new life in us. There's no other power anywhere in this world that can do that. Well, sometime later, we read that in the last several verses, 16 through 20. He met with his 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now listen, verse 18. Here's the new world. Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. That's quite an announcement. Because I have died and risen, there's a change in the structure of the universe. There's a world change happening. The Father is putting the reins of the universe in my hand for me to rule. You see, Jesus planted the seed of the new world through his death and resurrection. And now he has the right to reign over the world to grow that seed of death of the old and life of the new, death to sin, life to God, living for God, to take over the world with that seed and grow it into a tree, to make a whole new creation. Behold, he says, I am making everything new. And that's what he's doing now that he's ascended to heaven and he's on the throne of God, the right hand of God, sending forth his spirit through the gospel to change the world, to bring the gospel to all nations and change people's lives, putting that acorn in the tomb of their hearts, the acorn of the gospel to bring new life and to change lives around the world. Good Friday and Easter are good news that God wants the whole world to hear, and it is a world-changing message. Christianity is changing the world. Not if you read the news. Christianity, there is nothing that has had so much impact upon the world in the last 2,000 years than Christianity. And it continues, even though there's so much at war against it. Two closing calls this morning, brothers and sisters. What will we do with this good news? Number one, believe it. Believe it. Ask Jesus to save you from your sins and take over your life to plant his own life in you so that you no longer have to live in the guilt of your sin. And you no longer have to be controlled by the power of sin and ruled by Satan's lies. You no longer have to be afraid of death and judgment. You no longer have to be scared of God. I said the other evening at a visit, as a kid, I was afraid of the wall. I was scared of my sin. I was scared of dying. I was scared of God. And I told that to my parents. And they said, simply go to Jesus. He's taken care of all those three problems. Go to Jesus, crucified and risen from the dead, and then you'll be fully forgiven. You'll enter into a right relationship with God. Your sin is covered. Your judgment is taken. Your death is conquered. You can live for him then, and you can die for him. And then when you die, your death will not be a punishment. It's a doorway to heaven. And if you can't believe, dear brother, dear sister, if you can't believe... And we can't in our own strength. Ask him for the power to believe. His resurrection has that power for your dead heart. Tim Keller writes, the minute you decide to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, the power of the Spirit will invade your life, and that's the power of the resurrection, the same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Second, what should we do with good news? This good news, share it. Go and make disciples of all nations. The women were called immediately to go and tell others, even before they had met the risen Lord. And then the disciples were sent out. 
Tell others what Jesus did for you on Good Friday and Easter. You know, we can be afraid to tell others. What do we say? What will people think? What if I fail? What if I get in trouble? But Jesus has got your back. I am with you always to the end of the age. He's with you. You have the power of the risen king until he comes back to give you the words you speak and to bless the words that you say to save the lost and gather all his sheep. As Don Francisco was saying, I've got to tell somebody. Amen. Father, I've got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. Give us all that same energy by our own resurrection power to believe and to share. Thank you. A door of hope has been opened for us. We have good news. We praise you. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Let's sing 366. The strife is o'er, the battle done. The victory of life is won. The song of triumph has begun. Hallelujah. wonder if you would allow us to sing 227, stanzas 1, 3, and 4, How Great Thou Art. 227, 1, 3, and 4 as our doxology. 
Brothers and sisters, go your way with the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and let us return this afternoon to worship our risen King. Receive his parting blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.